How was that meal? Yes. All right. It's very good seeing you again at this annual event that takes place here at this headquarters uh, here in Malaga, New Jersey. Our first guest speaker will be Serena Fogg. And the title of her talk is Veganism, Key to Solving Climate Change. She became an intern here in 2014 here at the American Vegan Society. She is the newest advisor here. She is a vegan educator and speaker, co-founder of the International Vegan Earth Day March, which took place in 26 countries. She was born and raised a vegan in the state of Kansas. Uh, she has a sister and a brother. Uh, both parents are vegan. And she lives in the van. As you look around, you see off to the distance, there's her van. She travels and she, by way of the advertisement outside of her van, tells you the whole story about veganism, the importance of being compassionate and so forth and so on. I've written a poem, I think that may tie in with her talk. It's entitled, Yesterday I Couldn't, Today I Can, because some people feel they can't be vegan. Uh, from time to time, people tell me, hey, I can never be vegan. Well, if you say that you can or you say that you can't, both statements are correct. So I wrote this poem, yesterday I couldn't, today I can. Yesterday I couldn't, today I can. Yesterday I walked, today I ran. Yesterday was someone else's plan. And now I'm grown, I'm a full grown man. <laughs> Yesterday was winter cold, today has summer heat. Yesterday was scarce of food. Today, today gives lots to eat. Yesterday is dead and gone. Today is here and now. Problems will present themselves. Solutions will come somehow. And that's why she is here. That's why a lot of vegans are here to bring about solving the most important problems on this planet because we all share this world together. So without further ado, Please give a very, very warm welcome, Serena Farb. Yes. And thank you for the American Vegan Society for putting this on and all of the sponsors as well. It's really lovely. Today I'm going to be talking about why our diets and we have so much power as individuals to make a difference when it comes to climate change and environmental problems, but also why we have to go beyond that and why we have to take a broad, holistic perspective that isn't just focused in on a few scientific statistics and information. But before I get into that, as um, you just heard, I live in that van over there. And my kind of mission in life and everything I do is to be a walking billboard. I believe we are all walking billboards and advertisements essentially for our values, for the kind of world that we would like to see in the future and the interactions and way we live our lives. And this is everything from the t-shirts you wear to the clothes you wear, to the you know, house you live in, to the food you eat, the you know, food you bring to potlucks or share at Thanksgiving with your friends and family members. Every action we take is incredibly powerful so I, th since this is my you know, kind of life philosophy and how I try to live my life in general, I took it to the extreme. I was like, well, if I'm a walking billboard, I'm gonna make the vehicle I live in and drive everywhere a giant billboard for real. <laughs> so that's why it is over there covered in information. And this side says someone, not something. What you eat is a personal choice. Who you eat is not. And then the other side has a whole bunch of facts and information about sustainability and climate change and the environmental issues we're facing. I'm guessing a lot of you are already aware, but we are facing an enormous environmental and climate crisis right now. This is everything from climate change and greenhouse gas emissions that are heating up our planet, changing our atmosphere and weather patterns, causing more droughts, wildfires. Um, but even beyond climate change, we have a lot of other major environmental issues, such as ocean depletion, um, and pollution. We are depleting our oceans, we are overfishing them, we are just fishing them in general. We pull trillions of sentient living beings out of the oceans every year. And then we're dumping, 
you know, millions of tons of pollutants and chemicals and runoff from farms and animal agriculture in particular. A lot of that is going into the oceans, polluting them and killing wildlife, polluting them for us and for the future. We're polluting our air with smog and smells from the ways that we raise and kill animals for food all over the world, but in this country as well. Hog farms in particular are one of the largest, nastiest, most disgusting uh, blights that we have in this country where we cram thousands, again, of sentient living beings into these large metal warehouses and sheds. And then one of the things people don't realize, and this comes to the environmental impact of you know, fo our food system, is that animals like us go to the bathroom a lot, but at least here in the United States, we have a pretty decent waste management system. All of the farms, all of the literal billions of cows, pigs, chickens, and turkeys that we are breeding and bringing into existence for our food, these individuals that are raised and killed don't have waste management for their <laughs> feces and excrement. So we produce millions of pounds of excrement that sit in these large open air lagoons that just kind of off gas, create pollutants. There's a new documentary out called The Smell of Money that is really fantastic actually. And it is about the impact of hog farms in North Carolina in particular on a lot of the low income communities nearby that haven't had the resources to either move away or fight off the um, establishment of these farms. And one of the things that really stood out to me in this film, they talk about someone actually going into homes several miles away from these farms and like swabbing and wiping down the walls and finding like really thick amounts of fe pig feces on the walls several miles away from these farms. And one of the reasons for that is that when they have all these lagoons and all of this excrement and waste produced, which here's, here's a really powerful statistic to consider, a single dairy farm with several thousand cows on it produces more waste than a city of 400,000 people. One average dairy farm, more waste than a city of, uh, of several hundred thousand people. So that's how much excrement is being produced. And then farmers need something to do with it, so they try and repurpose it as fertilizer for crops that get fed to farmed animals as well. So they'll take low-flying planes, these giant hoses and nozzles, and just spray this all over their fields. And that's how it ends up in the air, stinking, smelling, causing asthma and health problems for the humans that live nearby and have to breed this as well, ending up in their homes. And then this also runs off into our waterways and rivers and oceans, harming all of the life there and uh, polluting them for us as well. So we have all of these massive environmental problems going on. Um, species extinction, this is another huge one that a lot of people don't think about. We have species dying off at an extraordinary rate uh, compared to the average rate of species going extinct on a daily basis. And the vast majority of these species going extinct are going extinct from areas like the Amazon rainforest or these tropical areas, which are being clear cut and deforested so quickly that species don't have a time, these individuals that make up these species, plants, animals, insects, don't have a time to recover. And they're dying out in mass. Some scientists are calling it the uh, sixth mass great extinction. So we have all of these environmental problems that we are facing right now. And there is one single industry on the planet that, do, that is doing more to contribute to all of these problems than any other and that is the food industry and animal agriculture in particular. And I wanna share a little bit more about why. So I've told you some of the facts, a little bit of the information about these environmental problems. Deforestation is, is one of the biggest that animal agriculture is driving. We hear a lot about the Amazon rainforest destruction. What a lot of people don't realize is that more than 80% of Amazon rainforest deforestation, more than 80% of the land that's already been deforested there currently has cows grazing on it. And that is the driving factor of rainforest destruction down there. And then of the tw other 20%, a lot of that land is being used to grow corn and soy. And people will say, oh, but what about corn and soy? You know, you vegans and your tofu, you're, you're, you're deforesting land too. 
when they don't realize that the vast majority of corn and soy crops grown in the Amazon and around the world, in the US included, are being used as feed crops to feed to cows, pigs, chickens, and turkeys. So it's definitely not for our uh, tofu consumption, which food for humans coming from corn and soy crops makes up about less than 20%, maybe even less than 15% in many areas. The vast majority are being used as feed crops. So why is this? Why does raising and killing animals for food have such a huge impact on our planet and the environment? I believe it comes down to an inherent inefficiency that we are ignoring most of the time. And if you think about it, any animal products, they take enormous and disproportionate resources because we have to use land, water, time, energy to feed and raise and grow up a cow, pig, chicken, or turkey you know, for several months to several years, depending on the species, until they're big enough and fat enough to be profitable to be slaughtered for meat. So if we think about it differently, if we spent all of that time, energy, water, money, land, and use that to grow feed directly for people instead of feeding these animals, growing feed crops to feed them, and giving all of our resources to them, and then us getting, you know, a little bit of something from them. It would be so much more efficient. So there's just this inherent inefficiency with cycling resources and nutrients through another living being before consuming them ourselves for energy. Put another way, in, and I used to teach uh, uh, chemistry and environmental science actually in high school. And one of the things that we teach in environmental science is something called trophic levels. And this is where you learn about the flow of energy through a food system or a food chain. And I hear a lot of people talk about the food system or the food chain and say, well, like we humans are, you know, at the top of the food chain. We've worked our way up here. We deserve to <laughs> get to slaughter and kill other sentient beings, I guess. But it's really common. I hear that argument a lot when I'm going around and speaking to people. And here's what I say. Like, that's great if you think it's natural to eat other animals. But what else about your lives right now are you doing that's natural? <laughs> Most of us probably drove here in cars. We live in homes built with machinery, probably have air conditioning. We go to the grocery store to get our food. And when people say it's natural to eat meat, what is natural about buying a styrofoam case of eggs or a plastic wrapped piece of someone else's flesh that was out of sight, out of mind? You have no idea how it was raised, killed, got to your plate. Or chicken wings from a fast food restaurant that have been cooked and created and look nothing like the individual or animal they once came from. That is not natural. So don't sit here and tell me that it's natural that we eat meat when most of what we're talking about are fast food restaurants and plastic wrapped pieces of flesh. We have a choice as humans with logic and intelligence and free will. Every time we go to the store or choose what we eat, we're making a choice. We're voting with our dollar. We're setting an example. We're that living, walking billboard of what we care about. And we have a choice as to whether we want to be at the top of the food chain, which we absolutely can, but which is incredibly inefficient and takes so much more energy, resources, water, and food to sustain the life of a single individual behaving as a carnivore. Or we have the choice to behave as what we actually uh, and I'm sure you'll hear about this later, are designed to actually thrive on as an herbivore and eat lower on the food chain, directly eating the plants that this earth grows and produces, rather than consuming all of these excess resources and creating this disproportionate environmental impact. So that's a choice that everyone sitting here today has. Every one of us always has a choice when we are going to the store and purchasing food. That is a vote with your dollar for what kind of world you want to see and what you care about. But I want to talk about beyond sustainability, right? So what does this mean? When I say beyond sustainability, I mean, I've just given you a lot of the facts about sustainability and environmental science, but I don't think this is enough. We need to take a broad, holistic look at what we're doing, because I don't believe that any of these environmental problems that I've mentioned today are the root cause. They are what I call symptoms. Climate change, pollution, freshwater uh, use, deforestation, species extinction. 
these are all symptoms of a much broader, deeper problem. And the root problem, which we must address if we want to solve these, is the way we are living on this planet and the way we are viewing and treating our fellow Earthlings and nature as a whole. Our current model is extraordinarily exploitative and dominated based. It's based on this idea of us being superior, these, these beings that can do whatever we want, and we are viewing the Earth and our fellow creatures on the Earth as objects that we can mine, extract, commodify, and exploit for our profits, for our you know, wants, desires, without taking into consideration that those are other sentient beings whose lives matter to them, who feel emotion and connection just like us. A lot of people don't know this, but pigs are considered uh, smarter than dogs, actually. Um, and, and I don't believe intelligence should be a reason that some people or some individuals get to live and others don't. But that's one way that we humans like to measure the worth of uh, beings. So just for that sake, right, pigs are smarter than dogs, maybe even smarter than uh, two-year-olds, two-year-old humans. But all of these, cows, pigs, chickens, turkeys, and fish, which get left out of the conversation a lot, they are all sentient beings with the capacity and ability to feel pain, suffer, want to live, have friends, family members, love their babies, just like we do. And when we focus just on sustainability, and we kind of have this reductionist framework, we are ignoring this more holistic picture of how we're living and being on this planet. And unless we start to shift that paradigm, I do not believe we will ever solve these environmental problems. And I want to explain a little bit more why. Reductionism is one way of looking at this. When we narrow in on a single fact or narrow in on climate change, for example, as being the it problem above all else, and we just need to do whatever we can to solve climate change. That, that's it, right? We're not going to get at the root issues. We're going to address what I consider this symptom. And we take that angle. One of the things that happens are, for example, if any of you have paid attention to some of the climate news, there's a lot of farmers and scientists talking about if we just feed cows this new type of seaweed, it reduces the amount of methane that they belch and produce. So therefore, we can reduce climate emissions a lot by changing the feed of the cows that we are raising and killing by the billions for food. An example of how this fails to solve our problems, it's a really sad story, but in the news a couple weeks ago, there was a fire at a dairy farm, I think it was in Texas, that uh, 18,000 cows died in this, this fire. You look at some of the news articles and they'll say like, oh, it was some uh, machinery that caught fire, something happened with machinery. And when you start to investigate and look a little deeper, and this isn't 100% verified, but it appears that this farm was one that was testing out again a new sustainable method of methane collection. They were trying to be more sustainable and reduce the impact of their dairy farm, which is inherently unsustainable, and collecting methane. Methane as a gas is very flammable. So they had this methane reactor, they were trying to collect methane and do something with it to be more sustainable, and it appears this may have been a big factor in why this dairy farm caught fire and then killed, in a horrific way, 18,000 cows. So these are examples of what a reductionist mindset at trying to solve our climate and environmental problems does. It allows us to ignore the root issue and zero in on problems, replicating the same paradigms and same structures in society that have created these problems in the first place. So we cannot continue living on this planet thinking we can do whatever we want to it, we can do whatever we want to nature, we can extract whatever we want from this planet, and that we can kill raise, breed, and kill our fellow earthlings because we want to. That model is not working. That model must change. We must shift our paradigm away from this. But I believe we're making incredible progress towards doing that. But the environmental community is still a little slow with this right now. 
as was mentioned in the introduction, I co-founded the International Vegan Earth Day March this past year that took place in 50 cities and 26 countries around the world. <laughs> One of the reasons I co-founded this was because I do not see the environmental community talking about this enough. It's like, we'll talk about all of these symptoms, all of these, these other issues, and ignore the root issues. And this is what we see with the push, you know, okay, we're admitting factory farming is a problem, but let's raise and kill animals in a more sustainable, regenerative, humane manner. All of these, these things that are getting talked about. But you know, when I first really saw this was in college, uh, this was 2014, there was a huge movement for my university to divest from fossil fuels for their climate emissions. And I went to one of the meetings. I was very excited. We had a very active campus. And I go to this meeting, and they are serving cookies with egg and cow's milk at their meeting. And I go up and talk to the organizers, and I you know, basically share some science with them. And I say, you know, I agree with you. We need to divest from fossil fuels. Climate emissions are a huge issue. And if this is really what we're trying to you know, do, why are you serving one of the products, cow's milk in particular, that has such a disproportionate environmental impact at our meeting about saving the environment and stopping climate change? This was one of the first times that I started to hear what is a really common narrative today. And they said something along the lines of, you know, individual change doesn't really matter. We need to focus on systemic change. We need to focus on putting the pressure on politicians and governments and corporations and hold them accountable for the environmental destruction they're doing. Has anyone else here heard that system change, not individual change narrative recently? It's becoming a lot more popular. And there's a piece of it, I want to be clear, that I agree with and I understand where it's coming from. Some people say that it was the fossil fuel companies that created the individual change narrative of change your light bulbs and drive less in the first place to distract from putting pressure on them. But that's in a very different segment uh, of this environmental problem. Talking about fossil fuels versus driving less, and you know, that's a little bit different than talking about the food we eat and our food system. One reason why is if we were to put pressure on corporations and have them change the way we want in terms of our energy infrastructure, behind the scenes they could switch to renewable energy with a much less environmental impact and very little relative impact on us. Like, when I flip on the lights in my house, I don't really notice, like, oh, is that, that energy coming from coal? Or is that energy coming from solar panels? To me, as the consumer, it doesn't really make much of a difference. It doesn't impact my ability to turn the lights on. But when it comes to food, we cannot change the food system behind the scenes without us being willing to change something, too. Because you can't just change the food system plant-based and have people like, not notice a difference. They're going to notice because the food that's going to be served places, the food that's going to be available at grocery stores is going to change if we're talking about system change. And a lot of people still don't want that. So when people aren't willing to make that change, we can't talk about system change. We can't have system change that the people don't want either. So that's why I really believe with these environmental problems, with trying to create a different paradigm with which we live on this planet, change has to start with us. Because while we can talk about system change all day long, at the end of the day, the only thing that we each truly have control over are our personal choices and our daily actions. So we can go and point the finger and tell governments and corporations to change, and they do. There are a lot of aspects of our system that are unfair and biased when it comes to subsidies and our tax dollars being used to bail out the dairy industry. Those things absolutely need to change. But how can we expect the CEOs of corporations to be willing to give up some of their profits or our politicians to you know, risk not being reelected if we're not willing to give up a burger for a bean burrito. We have to be willing to change what we're doing in our lives if we want other people to change. The change must start with us. And this is where the power of our individual choices really comes in. And I'm gonna come back to what I said about being a walking billboard. Because I hear a lot of people talk about veganism just being a boycott. And that as a boycott, it's 
not really that effective right now, right? We, when we have subsidies that are bailing out the dairy industry, which for those of you that aren't familiar with that, that basically means right now, due to the farm bill, which is being rewritten for the next five years, our tax dollars are being used to artificially keep up the supply of milk. The uh, consumption of milk and purchases of milk and dairy products are at a record low right now. Consumers have been voting with their dollar and saying, I don't want this anymore, or 75% of the world is lactose intolerant. This isn't healthy for me. I'm not a baby cow, and I want to drink almond, soy, coconut, oat milk. And we see the explosion of all of these options available at the grocery store. And yet, dairy supply hasn't changed a whole lot. And that's because the government is coming in and using our tax dollars and giving them to dairy farmers and saying, well, we're going to bail you out. We're going to keep you producing milk and keep you profitable, keep milk prices artificially cheap and lower than many of the alternatives through this biased, rigged political system. So that is absolutely happening. So I hear people come up and say to me, you know, our, we're not voting with our dollar. You know, this isn't working as a boycott because we have a rigged system. And I disagree, because veganism is so much more than just a boycott. It is what I said before about living in alignment with our values. We as individuals are these walking billboards, and we influence every single person that we interact with, from our friends, to our family members, to our coworkers, to strangers in the street who see you, you know, wearing a t-shirt or purchasing a vegan alternative at the grocery store. These interactions, set an example, and they show everyone around you, here's my values, here's how I'm gonna live my life, and I'm living in alignment with these values because they really matter to me. And, <laughs> and this is so powerful, and one way to look at this is, I heard the saying a while back, and I think it's based on some psychology or science, that we are some combination of the five people closest to us that we spend the most time with. And this comes up a lot when you hear people talk about quitting smoking or drinking. Like, if you hang out with a whole bunch of smokers and you're trying to quit smoking, that's gonna make it really hard to quit smoking and you might want to consider changing your social circle because we are so heavily influenced by the people we surround ourselves with. So I like to turn this around and say, if that's how influenceable we are by the five people we spend the most time with in our lives, what does that mean about the influence you have on everyone that you spend time with? If you're one of those five people, when you go vegan, when you say, I'm not going to support this violent and exploitative and environmentally destructive food system, I'm going to choose plant-based alternatives now, even if you don't talk about it, even if you don't have a van covered in information or wear a shirt, simply by you eating different food in front of your friends or family members, simply by being that living example, you are showing people what you care about. And I have seen it time and again, friends of mine who start to do that and then tell me, oh yeah, my coworker asked, she wants the recipe. Oh, you know, my mom's kind of interested now. She just needed the, the motivation or to see that example. And it spreads like this giant ripple effect where you may not think it's that powerful, but you have power as an individual with your walking billboard, and every choice you make influences, consciously or unconsciously, the people around you. So that's why veganism is so much more than a boycott, and it's really about living in your values, living the kind of future you wanna see. And that starts every day, and every single day, that you go to the store and make food choices and purchases, you have that power again and again and again. And there is no other daily action or choice in our lives that we get to make so frequently that has such an impact both directly and indirectly on the world around us. That's why we have to go beyond sustainability and change this paradigm. And I truly believe we are so much closer to fundamentally shifting this paradigm and world we live in than we all realize. Because there's a lot of social change research that suggests we don't need a majority or you know, more than a majority of the population to do something for it to change rapidly. Social change actually has been shown to happen, not on a linear scale, but on this slow progression 
where some kind of tipping point is reached where then a paradigm shifts very rapidly. And this has happened with scientific paradigms, like when we went from thinking that the Earth was the center of the universe to the sun. Um, this has happened with social change and other social injustices. There's so many different, and they're called paradigm shifts, where we thought one thing that was the norm in society, and it quickly changed to something else being the norm. And I think that's what we're approaching with veganism. And it's really hard to tell how far away from those tipping points we are when we're living in them in the moment. It can feel like it's so far away and so few uh, people you know or so little of the population are changing their diets or lifestyles. But the numbers really are changing and we can see it in the number of restaurants and how much easier it is to get vegan options everywhere now in the number of organizations and groups that exist. It's exploding very rapidly. And so social change research suggests that we actually only need between 10 to 25% of the population to strongly hold a belief before we reach these tipping points where then suddenly everything changes very rapidly. So this is what gives me hope and what I encourage all of you to keep thinking about if you feel hopeless or you feel like I'm just one person, my choices don't make a difference. They do. They make a difference to everyone in your lives and you get to be part of creating this new paradigm shift where we stop looking at the world around us as commodifiable, exploitable objects and we start living in harmony with nature and our fellow earthlings. And with that, we truly can change the world and solve a majority of our environmental problems by getting at this root issue. Thank you. Um, great question. So the question was, I seem to be on the pulse of where people are disagreeing with this message, but where, are, where am I finding people most in agreement with it? So a lot of what I do is actually going around speaking in university classrooms and some high school classrooms as well. And that is actually where I've found the most receptive audience. Um, a lot of the things that I talk about being messages that I hear from people are online actually, <laughs> believe it or not. I think people, things go viral on social media, ideas get out there, people argue a lot in the comments, and there's definitely people that, I mean, and some of this I've heard in real life in college, actually I heard a lot of it. I went to school at a university, a rural liberal arts college in the middle of cornfields and hog farms in Iowa. So I heard a lot of that there, and that's actually one of the biggest things I've noticed when I'm speaking to university classrooms, the biggest difference has not been with, like what state um, the schools are in. It's actually been whether it's a university in a city or whether it's a rural university. That is where I've noticed the biggest difference between students being really receptive versus having a lot more pushback and concerns. Um, but by and large, uh, the rural schools have a lot more concerns. Yep, if you're a lot more connected to knowing farmers, farming communities, you're gonna say a lot more of the, what about this, what about this, what about this? And I think, and I think that's one of the great things about like a health approach is that while I'm very ethics and sustainability driven as well, I've seen that when people start eating plants for any reason, whether that's health or environment or anything else, simply by the fact that they're not as attached to the foods that they once were, they become a lot more open-minded to considering all of the benefits, all of the reasons. So I've seen a lot of people who were trying to reverse their heart disease or something or, or started moving plant-based for that, wouldn't, didn't want to talk about the animals, didn't want to talk about the ethics. And then once they'd been away from eating animals and started to develop new habits and were like, oh, this isn't that hard, I'm not as attached to it, then they were like, okay, well, now let me learn about the ethics. Now let me you know, embrace these other reasons. And so I've seen that a lot. And so I think that's where you get the pushback is when you have people who they're very attached to it. It is so much part of their tradition, their culture, their families, their livelihoods, that they don't even, they're gonna put up any resistance they can at all. But I've gotten so much positive feedback from classrooms full of university students. And I have a very carefully laid out presentation um, that starts with sustainability information, briefly talks about debunking some of the health arguments, and then goes into ethics. And I've found that that is 
works. I've tried a lot of different orders and, you know, I used to want to come in with the ethics first. Let's go animal rights. This is, you know, I do the presentation the way I do now because I've seen the different responses it gets. And if you come in first and you start by debunking all the things you expect, somebody might say, so I answer the what about protein and the what about farmers and the, you know, what isn't it natural? I answer all of the most common things that I have heard. And then I'm like, well, now that I've answered all the things you're going to say after I tell you this, then they have nothing left to say because I've already <laughs> preemptively answered all of that. And then they're just like, I guess I have to think about it now. <laughs> uh, so the question is, have I gotten any um, like violent responses or anything while I'm driving my very obvious van? And that's actually one of the most common questions that vegans ask me. And I have not. I like, I get thumbs up. Um, if I do, like sometimes I just kind of zone out and I'm driving and I forget. So actually this happened the other day. I was in Rochester um, with someone who had sent some talks up with me, Rochester, New York. And we were driving and this car pulls up behind it or like right next to us, starts honking and waving, giving us a big thumbs up. And the person with me is like, what, what's that about? What are you? And I'm like, remember, you're in my van. <laughs> um, so I get reactions like that and really haven't even like been flipped off or anything like that. So if I have, I don't notice it. Okay. Yeah, great question. So the question is, um, there's a lot of talk about the dairy industry in Pennsylvania collapsing and only kind of existing because of the government subsidies and things like this. So have I heard about any programs to support farmers transitioning away from animal farming to plants? And yes, there's um, some friends of mine run something called the Farm Transition Academy where they are actually, they're working on training vegans and activists in the best and most effective ways to directly outreach to farmers like in their community and give them the resources of how to switch to doing something different. So that's Farm Transition Academy. And then um, Renee King Sonnen from Rowdy Girl Sanctuary and the Rancher Advocacy Program. She is a former cattle rancher who started a sanctuary instead. And she has actually been helping, similarly doing farmer outreach. And there's, uh, she's, I think it's in her new documentary that just came out, but she's got a farm she worked with in Oklahoma or Arkansas that was a, like, I think a semi-large chicken farm. And she helped them convert it into a mushroom farm because a lot of the conditions and environments that they, you know, do chicken farming in are very conducive to growing mushrooms successfully. So. Definitely uh, organizations and people out there doing that important work. So the question is, you like that I was talking about symptoms, that all these environmental problems are symptoms and not the root cause, and that the root cause is, yeah, it's our relationship to nature and our economic model of just growth and, and economic growth and profiting off of everything, and how do we, how do we change that? I think there's, there are two factors that we really need to address. One is we have to change the system, the economic structures, our existing models, governments, um, institutions that are entirely currently built on economic growth, destroying nature, commodifying and selling everything. We also have to change at an individual level. And, I, and that's kind of like what I said in my talk. And I think the individual will also change the systemic so we as individuals, I think I'm a big advocate of everyone getting involved and calling your legislators, telling them, you know, vote against subsidies in the farm bill and, you know, change these systems. But that's where I really think, like, the system is made up of individuals that are all operating off of kind of a selfish paradigm of, like, I want, I want this, I want that, I want to always buy new clothes, I want to get the newest, latest, best this. And it's an interplay between the system and the individuals. They both influence each other. Um, but the system is made up of individuals. And so that's why I'm really a big believer in being the change. And that if all the individuals start living from a mentality of interconnectedness and recognizing the other beings and the way that our personal choices do impact and influence those around us and the environment, and, and living in a way that's in alignment with a belief of ahimsa and non-exploitation and non-violence, that the more, the, indivi the more individuals are doing that in the system, that will start to change the system as well. Um, and I, I really think that's how we change things. <laughs>
Okay. Who do I recommend following? A lot of the people that I am going to recommend or that I really like, there's a lot of like big influencers that I do really like, but the people that I most resonate with aren't the traditional influencer type because they're maybe working on things that aren't just constantly kind of on the treadmill of trying to keep viral content going out there. Um, so well, one person I'll mention is Dr. Silesh Rao of climatehealers.org. He is probably one of the most um, holistic and intriguing uh, environmental and sustainability vegan advocates. And he talks a lot about the importance of paradigm shifts. He talks about how our society is built on these axes of um, like commodification and exploitation. And we need to sort of change the, the axes that our society is built on to ones of nonviolence and um, things like that. The statistics on the other side of my van, um, the numbers about the impact animal agriculture has on different climate things, one of those numbers on uh, climate change is from a white paper that he wrote. Silas Rao. And then there's so many other people. Uh, I'll list a couple, again, not traditional influencers. Um, Nivi Joswal of the Javinity Foundation, or the Versa Foundation and the Javinity Project, um, either one. She does really great work um, looking at the sort of social science factors of why people eat what they eat and how culture and colonization and injustice and all of these different factors uh, play a role. Similar, um, I'm going to mention, I'll mention one more here, Eloisa Trinidad, she's the executive director of Chili's on Wheels, doing like food justice work in New York City and has been responsible for getting community like vegetable fridges, uh, I think all over the city, like really helping make plant-based foods accessible to people at all income levels and kind of changing that aspect of the system. So those are people that I very rec highly recommend. <laughs> uh, what's your Instagram account? What are they? <laughs> Born Vegan One, um, Instagram, YouTube. If you look up Born Vegan, that's where you'll find me.